Bruce. He's heading that up. And all the details are on the, in the flyer in your bulletin. So if you didn't get a bulletin, be sure and grab one on your way out so you have the details for that. But we would love to have you come and be a part of that. So I don't know if it's a good day or a bad day when the pastor steps into the pulpit with a roll of duct tape. It's a good day? It's a good day anyway, right? Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Are you cheering that I put my glasses on? It's getting harder and harder to read these little words. I heard a couple of amens out there. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I'm going to read a passage of scripture. We're going to watch a short three minute video. And then we're going to have church. Ephesians chapter 1, or 4, verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Everybody say unity of the Spirit. Through the bond of peace, there is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope. Shout that word, hope. When you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Jump down to verse 13. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Everybody say become mature. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I don't know about you, but I am not there yet. The whole measure of the fullness of Christ being mature and complete. And sometimes, sometimes, I stoop to the level of my flesh. Anybody else ever stoop to the level of your flesh, unfortunately? I, I want you to watch this video. It's by Andy Stanley. Probably many of you have seen it. Millions of people have, have said, Pastor... You need to watch this, and you need to show this to the congregation on Sunday morning. One of the things that is really on the forefront of our Christian thought process is where our country is as we approach election time. And some people are getting all worked up. And it's causing a polarization in our nation between people. And I want to I look at this from a scriptural perspective. So watch this video, and then we're going to have church. Now, real quick, I want to say something to a couple groups, all right? First, I want to say something to all of you who are 45 years old and older. You don't have to raise your hand, okay? 45 and older. Look up here. Many of you have grown weary and you've lost heart. And the reason is because you have fixed your eyes on a political system, you have fixed your eyes on a political leader, you have fixed your eyes on the good old days, you fixed your eyes on the economy, and you are, you are growing weary, and you need to knock it off. And I'll tell you why. Because you are scaring the children. <laughs> you are. Now look up here, look, look. The generation that's coming along behind us are going to take their cue from us. And here's the cue we're giving them. Oh my goodness, if we don't get the right person in the, in the, you know, elected in office, it's the end of the world. If we don't fix the economy, it's the end of the world. If we don't have religious freedom like my mama and my grandmama had religious freedom, it's the end of the world. Oh my goodness, if we don't get the right laws passed, if we don't have the right policies, it's all coming unraveled. 
Nothing could be further from the truth. Look up here. Government and government matters, policies matter, but neither of those matter as much as men and women who understand this word. Faith, confidence that God keeps his promises and that nothing can thwart the plans of God. We know this from the Old Testament. We know this from the New Testament. We know this because the most powerful person in Judea, Pilate, looked at Jesus and said, what is truth? Crucify him, game over, it's done, let's move on. And the only reason you know who Pilate is, the only reason you know who Pilate is, is because you know the story of Jesus. Pilate, the governor, becomes a footnote in the story of Jesus. In fact, most of the first century people you know about, you know about because they're part of the story of Jesus. We have nothing to fear. So all of you people over 45, knock it off. You need to model for the next generation that God is in control. God can be trusted. Get involved in the political system. Get involved in culture. Get involved in your society. But you never fix your eyes there. You fix your eyes on Jesus. Now, for those of you who are under 45, especially if you're 20 and 30, look up here. Do not grow weary and lose heart. Do not grow weary and lose heart. And don't fix your eyes on social media, and don't fix your eyes on Washington, D.C., and don't fix your eyes on my generation. Look up here. Do not grow weary and do not lose heart because once upon a time, a group of people your age embraced a resurrected savior and embraced the teaching of a resurrected savior and a group of people from your generation that were your age changed the world. And they did it through faith and they did it through the behavior connected to faith. Now that video is gonna set a backdrop or it, it, it quantified something that I think we as a church must address as we approach these next four weeks. Because some of us are panicking and wondering what's gonna happen, just like he said. And we have to come back to what the scripture says in several areas if we are going to be people who aren't just out there screaming the sky is falling and we're people that are focusing on what the book says. And so today, I want to look particularly at what it, what it is to live in peace in divided times. What it is to live in peace in divided times. And maybe you looked at your life and you said, I am so out of peace because of some of the political things that he referred to, because of some of the racial divisions that are happening in our nation and it's polarizing everything. But how do I live in peace in the middle of this? I was... Driving home last night, I was down in Line Fork, Kentucky for a few days with Pastor Mary Bennett. I was driving home last night and I drove past a church. And you know, I like to read the little signs that are outside of the churches. And this particular sign said, the donkey and the elephant are fighting. Look to the lamb. I like that one. The donkey and the elephant are fighting. Look to the lamb. Now he's referring to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. How cool is that? And sometimes we get so focused on the donkey and the elephant fighting. And what happens to our peace? Just tell me, what happens to our peace? Poof! Gone! So let's look at the scripture. What does the scripture say about this in Ephesians chapter 4? My wife, um, she, she likes this. Uh, is, it, is it the website, Blimey Cow? Yeah, the website. It's, it's a YouTube channel. And on this, she said, you've got to watch this. Because she knew I was preparing for this message a couple of weeks ago. And she said... You've got to watch this. And, and there was this little skit. And in this skit, it had a guy that was talking about life teams. 
Which life team are you on? And he said, he talked about political life teams and religious life teams and socioeconomic life teams or racial life teams. And he's going on and he's making a, um, a, a, a kind of showing us how ridiculous it is where we put ourselves on these teams. And then my team is opposing your team. And we polarize everything. And scripture says, unity in the bond of peace. Uh oh. That doesn't sound like where we live, does it? Growing up, uh, you know, I'm a car guy and uh, apparently in the men's calendar that's coming out, I'm going to uh, be, be the September representative on that for a, uh, the car guy. Not sure what that's going to look like, you know, striking a pose with a wrench in my hand or something. But um, so, so growing up, both my grandparents were, were General Motors people. My grandpa drove a, an Oldsmobile, and my other grandpa drove a Buick, and my dad drove a Chevy. And we had a, a life team. It was called General Motors Criders. And anyone that drove anything else, we would set ourselves up with our boundaries. You bring your 302 Mustang and we will take it out with our 327 any day of the week. And we were back and forth and we were, it was, it was one of those, bring me your best shot and I will shut you down in the, vo in the voice of the Beach Boys. And so I remember going through high school. Actually, I was, in, I was probably in, in uh, late elementary or middle school, and we had this showdown on the back of the bus. And I was Chevy, and the other kid was Ford, because their, their dad, his dad drove a Ford, and my dad drove a Chevy. And we were going back and forth. My Chevy's better than your Ford. We had no, at that point, nothing to stand on except our family heritage, right? Which brings me to all of our family heritage, how many preconceived ideas do we have about other people who actually are in the church that have a different political bent, a different socioeconomic bent, a different philosophy, a different car company? See, I can laugh about that because we're like, ha, 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 ha. But let's say we get down to the nitty gritty. What if we start talking about the donkey? And what if we start talking about the elephant? And who stands where in which camp? And I want you to stand up. Oh, no, we're not going to do that because we're going to be in our life team. What does it mean to be in unity in the bond of peace? So I remember the day when I bought a Ford. And I drove to my grandfather's house. And I parked it in the driveway. I was married by that time. My wife corrupted me apparently, but it was a nice car. And Grandpa walked out, looked at it, and just stood there and looked at it. And then he looked at me. Need I say more? I had abandoned the family life team. And we reconciled. It was okay. We made jokes about it and so forth. And life went on. But I remember specific conversations, specific innuendos in my upbringing when there were different things that were like, oh, we don't associate with those people of a different political party. Well, why not? Even though they're Christ followers and we don't act like that because you're, hopefully there's some things that are going off in your head that are reminding you of 
conversations that have happened in your family history and household because right now, today, I want you to look to your left and look to your right and I want you to see people that Christ says in Ephesians here that uh, Paul says that we are supposed to walk in unity in the bond of peace. You see, it's not about what car we drive. It's not about what political party we're in. It's not about our socioeconomic status. It's not about our race. It's not about our gender. It is about the unity in Christ. So what does this look like? What does it look like for us to walk in maturity? Because he says here that in maturity, if we're not walking this way, then we are not mature. We don't mature. And so we spend so much time fighting each other that we don't have time to grow up. I, I made some really stupid comments about somebody else's car brand and I was in complete ignorance at the time. Don't we do that today? Let me just ask you a question. Don't raise your hand. But how many of you have had a conversation with someone, let's pick on the donkey and the, and the uh, elephant, someone of a different political persuasion and ask them to have coffee and a conversation? Some of you just, your blood pressure just shot through the roof. And you said, can't do it. There's no way I would not sit down and have that conversation. Back to the bus. I'm going back. My Chevy is better than your Ford. But I liked the kid that drove. His parents drove the Ford. I liked him. I remember specifically the time when I compromised and I, I, I had to somehow cross this bridge and I said, hmm, how can I do this? Well, I still had to stand that Chevy had a better engine than the Ford. But I could compromise that, you know, well, Ford does have, you know, better body in their trucks. They don't rust out as much. Okay, I, I could compromise on that. But I was standing my ground on something, giving a little bit because I, I like the person. What, what would happen if in the body of Christ we had dialogue with people that had differences and we were able to say, because I like you and I actually love you, I know that you love Jesus too. Maybe we could have a conversation here and come out more unified. And we're going to get to that in just a second. We're going to have a little illustration. Our differences and divisions often keep us from maturity in Christ. We're fighting our differences so much that we don't come to maturity. We're distracted. Wouldn't the enemy love to diffuse our energy to the point where we are ineffective as Christ followers. What if all this political stuff was just a distraction to keep us from maturity? Maybe it is. I believe there's a maturity individually and corporately. We can grow up into the body of Christ together in unity and in love with one another. So, how do we become mature in the body of Christ? Number one, look at verse two. What does it say? It says, be completely humble. Could we just shout out those words? Completely humble! I don't think you heard that. That was a humble response. How about a completely humble response? Okay. There you go. Thank you. Thank you for leading the way. James 4, 6 says, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives favor or grace to the humble. When we walk in pride, number one, we will not become mature and complete, and we will not see the unity that Christ wants in the church. We must 
walk in humility. When we come at someone, anybody ever come at you? They have a difference of opinion, so instead of coming and reasoning together, they come at you. Oh, don't come at me. Because I, it will take all of my Christian bones in my body not to come back at you. Glory to God. That sanctification process is still at work. And I'm easy to get along with most of the time. But when somebody comes at me, I just want to punch him in the face. I've never hit anybody. But I want to let him have it. It's kind of that mirroring thing, you know? I'm good with you. We can get along. Don't come at me. I remember one time I was, I was a youth pastor and a guy came to the door and he was really mad. He was one of the kids from the neighborhood, one of the young men from the neighborhood. And he was mad. He was mad at me. And he came in with a stick and he said, I'm going to kill you. Come into the church. I was right in the lobby, not this church, but I was in the lobby of the church. And like Dave Wilkerson, if you know who Dave Wilkerson was, he said, Nicky Cruz said to him, I'm going to cut you up into little pieces. And Dave Wilkerson said, and if you cut me up into little pieces, every one of those little pieces is going to be crying out with love for you, Nicky. And I couldn't think what to say to the guy, and I didn't want to punch him in the face, so I plagiarized Dave Wilkerson, and I said, you can beat me up and you can cut me up, but every one of those pieces is going to be crying out for love for you. And he got so mad, he dropped his stick and he went away, duh, slammed the door. So I took his stick and I took it on the bandsaw and I cut it up into little pieces. I figured if I'm not going to get hit, he, he's going to get, and I stuck it in a little bucket. And he had the gall to come back and ask for his whooping stick back. And so I reached up on top of my bookshelf and I took it out in a little bucket and I gave him his, I gave him his whooping stick back. And, uh, and he looked at it and he looked at me. He just shook his head and he just walked away. Well, I'm, I'm here. He didn't, he didn't kill me. But that's where the grace of God comes in because I, I didn't want to be humble. I wanted to show that I was bigger than he was. He probably had a gun, but I, I mean, uh, I had to walk, you know, in humility. What would Jesus do? Remember the, remember the bracelet? What would Jesus do? He walked in humility when they put him on the cross. It's not easy and it's not fun to walk in humility. But if you choose to walk in humility, it opens the door to maturity. Let's think about this and where we are in our divided nation right now. What does it look like for you to walk in humility when it comes to expressing these opinions and these things that have been generationally in you, ingrained in you? And how do I walk in humility? Well, it opens the door for maturity in you if you can do it. God, I need your grace to walk in humility. Because we think the, the leader has to be the one that comes in with the, the right word and we come in and we exercise our authority in a heavy handedness and we win the battle. Glory to God. Or is it in humility and truth that we begin a process that brings us to maturity and opens the door for other people to come in to the truth. As humans, we so easily get caught up in the world's way of doing things and solving problems. We get into shouting matches, which just escalate. Rather than saying, Lord, 
would you intervene? Our blood pressure goes up, our peace goes out the window. It's, there's no maturity happening in us because we're so focused on these issues at hand rather than on the God who is able to bring peace and unity, not only to our nation, but to our own heart, to our church, to the church at large. Another thing he says here in verse 3. First, we have to have humility. Then, he says, we have to persevere. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. It is work, church, to walk in the unity of the Spirit. It's work. It takes perseverance. How many times have we said... Well, I've tried that, and it didn't work. Did you ever hear that in the church? Well, we've tried that. We tried it 30 years ago, and it didn't work. It's not going to work today, Pastor. Well, is it the Word of God? Guess what? It's going to work. Well, I prayed for that. I thought the Bible said that. And when it didn't work, I began to doubt the one that wrote it. He's always faithful to his promises. When it says keep the unity, that's an indication that there was already a unity at some point and we need to keep a unity. Some people are friends until election year rolls around. You go to your camp, I'll go to my camp, I'll lick my wounds if I lose and you lick your wounds if you win and I'll send you a nice little Facebook message saying, well, I guess God knew what he was doing because that's the way it goes. Oh, we invoke God on all kinds of things that he did not even have anything to do with. Like football scores, you know? I have some people that I love to heckle, depending on what their football team persuasion is. All right, Lynn, this one's for you. <laughs> the joke's on me on this one, though. So uh, she likes a team that's, you know, somewhere from New York. Uh, humility, we're talking about humility. The, 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 the Giants, okay? And, uh, of course, being a Philly, you know, native uh, area person, I, I would have to go with the Eagles. And uh, the Eagles, you know, rising up with wings on Eagles and, you know, you running up, uh, killing the Giants, all those kind of things. So, um, uh, anyway, you know, my son, you want to talk about a, a humbling experience here. This is on me. So my son comes home from the thrift store with a, a stuffed, like, it, it looks like a, a, a football, you know, and it's got this NY thing on the side of it. It's blue. And um, so he says, Dad, 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 he's all excited. And he says, watch this. And it turns inside out, and it's a little bear, you know, with a, with a, a G on the front for the Giants. And, uh, and I said, oh, Gavin, Gavin. I said, uh, uh, I have this little baby eagle stuffed animal, you know, and I would gladly trade you. We need to send that back to the thrift store, okay? It doesn't need to be there. I have some great people that would love it. We'll give it to them. They have kids. They would love this little thing. And he looks at me with just the most sincere eyes, and he says, oh, no, Dad. It has a G on it for Gavin. <laughs> no amount of indoctrination is going to get the boy to be an Eagles fan. I have to suffer in humility. And persevere, apparently. Make every effort to live in unity. And you know what? Because I love my son, I am fine with have, having a blue football with a G on it in his bed. Much to the joy of some of the people who sit in this room. <laughs> but we persevere. We move on. 
even when it's tough. Perseverance is painful, but we try again. Perseverance is the work, everybody say work, that brings maturity. It's the work that brings maturity. Even in our differences, through the work, God grows us up. Isn't that something? The difficulties that we go through, the work that we go through, that is one of the ways that we become mature. So we, we walk in maturity, verse 3 says, make every effort to keep the unity of the peace through the, or the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And I want to illustrate this unity. Where's a hawk and chop? I need you guys to come up here. If you're in the men's group, you know, you know who they are. And, uh, and they're going to they're gonna stand beside each other up here. And there, there are several words here. It says unity through the bond of peace. And this, this is only used twice here where it talks about unity. And the unity is oneness. It is a, a likeness of nature that comes with the Lord. It's not something that comes naturally. Not something that man does. And then it talks about this bond, which is actually literally a banding together in the Greek. If you've ever worked in, at a place where it had pallets and you had to band them together, sometimes with metal, sometimes with, with um, plastic uh, bands and they cinch up. That's the type of, of bond or banding that it has. And then this idea of peace, if you're familiar with the Hebrew, it's a, a Greek version of shalom. It's wholeness. There's a wellness that is there. Now, unity is not always sameness. Now, there, there are a lot of similarities here, okay? But if you look at these two guys, you'll notice that they're very different. One has a tie on, and one is exercising his right to bear arms. Second Amendment. Antonio works in an office. Billy? works out in the elements. Billy rides a Harley. Antonio prefers a minivan. I have watched these two very different guys, West Virginia, Alabama. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. <laughs> I have watched these two guys exemplify this scripture for the last, what, two years? Two years. Now here is what this looks like when two people walk together in unity. Let me ask you guys a question. I told them that they wouldn't have to talk at all so you can nod your head being true to my word. Do you guys always agree on everything? It didn't take them long to figure that one out. Would you say that you walk in unity? I want you to put your, put your arms up. Okay? I already told him this was going to hurt. He's going to hurt him. It's going to hurt him more. <laughs> All right. Told you it's a bit dangerous day when the pastor shows up in the pulpit with duct tape. The scripture says that these two can walk in unity. Just, you know, walk up there and walk back here, okay? All right. I turn around. Don't get back there too far. Come on now. As you can see, Billy's still being sanctified here. This is, uh... <laughs> see, he can get away with it. I can't as a preacher, you know. He's, uh... So, I'm going to demonstrate 
what should never happen between Christ followers in a church. And no, you can't punch me in the face, okay? That's not, that's not what we're talking about. All right, so if there's disunity or things begin to unravel a little bit, ah, the first layer sometimes isn't too bad. <laughs> the reason he's laughing is because he doesn't have any hair on his arms. <laughs> The reason he's not laughing is because he doesn't have any hair on his arm now either. <laughs> now what, 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 do you observe, what do you observe about that part of the tape? There's a lot of blonde hair. That's a lot of blonde hair. I'm not seeing much blonde hair on you, bro. No. Yeah, it's Yeti hair. <laughs> but think about this. What happens in your life when two very different people come together and try and walk in unity, sometimes it's in the church, sometimes it's in your job, sometimes it's in your family, sometimes it's between brother and sister, mom and dad, and you come into what looks like unity and then something tears them apart. You got, you got some skin in the game. So there's either a choice that says, I'm not going to associate with people who are different than me, or I'm going to take a risk and I'm going to do what the scripture says because I want to grow to maturity. And grow some hair back. And grow some hair back, right. <laughs> but here's what I've seen. With you guys choosing to walk together very different guys, but walk together and lead well, now you have biblical unity, not always agreement. Can we just say that together? We don't always have to agree to have unity. I don't think they heard that. We don't always have to agree to have unity. Okay, just making sure. I've watched you guys have conversations, push back, back and forth. Do you trust him? Yeah. Do you trust him? I know, th I know that those words are not just words. I see that. And when you come together with a difference, you push back, push back, push back until you come to unity. Can we give those guys a... Uh, Here's a little souvenir for you. <laughs> he can have it. All right. Yeah. There you go. That's true friendship right there when you take the hairy duct tape. We've got to be humble if we're going to walk to maturity. We've got to persevere. Don't give up. Remember, in humility, it's not about you. It's not about you. And we've got to learn to walk in unity with people who are different from us. Church, what would happen if we as a body came together and showed what it was to have a unified relationship with a bunch of Christ followers instead of a bunch of Christians out there nitpicking everything about everything and the world looking at us and say they are the most disunified band of people and they are so distracted from the real things that are going on and they have nothing that I am interested in because it's better out here than it is in your church. Hopefully I've stepped on a couple of toes today. I hope I did. Because church, we should be the example of what it is to have differences, but unity. And the world's going to look at that and say, how do they do that? Because out here, we're setting up the borders of our life teams. We're ready for a fight. It's my team against your team, and one of us is going to win, and one of us is going to lose. And I'm going to let you know if you're the loser. And I'm going to pretend nothing happened if I'm the winner. I'm just going to go and post about it on Facebook to all of my friends that are of my same life team so that we can have our little private message chats. 
What does it look like for you today? We're going we're gonna to receive communion here in just a, a couple of moments. And here are some questions that I want you to ask yourself as we apply this scripture here. Let me read this scripture one more time, and then I'm going to ask these questions. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Every one of you have received a calling. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, the bond of shalom. There's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Verse 13, he says, Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So where do you need to walk in humility today? For some of us, that's a conversation to someone that we have recently offended with a comment about a divisive thing that's going on in our nation now. Maybe it's racially, maybe it's politically, maybe it's about those people or that situation or you know when we start referring to those people, whoever those people are, it's polarizing. We do it all the time. Oh, well, I don't agree with those people. Well, we've drawn a line. We've defined our life team in some way. And we've created an opponent. So who do we need to walk in, in, in humility with? And some of us just need to take a chill pill. Second question is, do you feel like quitting? There's some here that just feel like quitting and throwing in the towel and saying, it's not worth it. I can't face all of this stuff because it's stolen my peace. And I just want to say today that there is a restorer of peace who is here, who loves you, who loves us, who loves the body of Christ. Loves people. His name is Jesus. And he's come to restore your peace. Today is a day where your peace can be restored. And then thirdly, are there any rifts that you need to mend to restore unity? I, I hate to say this, and, and I, I just wonder if maybe there are families who have been divided and are now being divided, not because of a football team, maybe because of a football team, maybe because of the election, maybe because of who stands on which side of the fence on which issue, and you need to be the humble one and you need to be the person that takes the high road and make that phone call and say, I might not agree with you, but I want to be restored in unity with you. Maybe it's an apology to a brother or sister or somebody who's different than you. What does that look like? Because we have an opportunity for humble perseverance to open a door for the presence of God to enter the lives of people who need heaven's change. Fact of the matter is, folks, all of this that we see is going to pass away. The people around you are the ones that you're going to spend eternity with. Wouldn't it be a bummer to get into heaven? And you have set up a wall around you on your life team where you say, I'm going to spend eternity over here because I'm an elephant or I'm a donkey or I'm this color or I'm that color or I'm whatever, whatever, whatever. I don't think God's going to let us do it and he gives us the opportunity now to get it right. So as we receive communion this morning, I want you to do it in a way that is meaningful 
I think one of my most memorable communion services was when I was in Bible school and we had pieces of bread and we went and we broke bread with other people and we prayed together and the title of the message that was preached that day was called One Loaf One Loaf and Jesus took one loaf and he broke it and he gave it to them and, and they gave it to the other people, you know, when he was feeding the 5,000 and they, they fed these five loaves and two fishes fed everybody. And in, in, he broke this, this common loaf and he gave it to his disciples and they shared and they partook of it together. And I don't want to make this an awkward thing. I don't want to make this anything that is, uh, that, that you feel like you feel pressured to do. But if the Lord is asking you to break your little loaf, your little wafer, your little cracker with someone and pray with them or have them pray with you about a particular thing, I, I want to give you the freedom to do that today. Maybe they're here. Maybe it's a, a text before you receive. You know, the, the Bible says that if you're bringing your gift to the altar and you recognize that someone has ought against you or you're not in right relationship with someone, you're to leave your gift at the altar, you're to go and make it right, and then you're supposed to come back and then your, your gift is, is acceptable. And I think it's the same way with communion. Maybe you need to send a text to someone apologizing for something that you've recently said. Maybe you need to go on Facebook and you need to delete something that you said that was polarizing that wasn't in unity. Maybe you need to go and you need to say, you know, I, this is hard. I've been holding something against you and I need to ask for your forgiveness. And then receive communion. Maybe it's somebody that you're not able to get in contact with before and you receive communion in faith and you say, man, I'm going to go and I'm going to make this right. I'm going to walk in unity. I'm going to choose to walk in unity. I'm going to choose to walk in unity according to the bond of peace. Whatever that looks like for you today. Elders, if you will come and bring the, uh, the elements here. <clears throat> I want to pray that God's work and God's will would be done through us, his church, and we would be a great representation to people who don't even know Christ, but they see the unity and they say, if those people can do it, I want what they have because they have something that we do not see in our humanistic culture. Just look around us every single day. The newspaper divides us. We are so chunked up and divided. And yet Christ says, would you as the church be that example to bring it all together? I'd like you to stand with me. I'm going to pray a prayer. And, and then I'm going to invite you to, to come. If you'd like prayer, uh, we have prayer team members that will be here to pray for you, maybe in a specific area. Maybe there's somebody that you're really having a tough time with and you want prayer to mend that relationship and walk in unity. Lord, I thank you that today you have given us these elements. You've given us the, the cup. You've given us the, the bread, the representation of your broken body. And your word says that as often as we drink it, as often as we eat it, we're to do this in remembrance of you. Lord, you are the ultimate example of what it is to walk in humility. The complete power of heaven, yet humbly crucified for our, for our wholeness. Lord, I bless this bread. I bless this cup in Jesus' name. And I pray that we as a church would walk in humble, persevering unity. In Jesus' name, amen.